Okay, so tonight we're wrapping up the first major section of Romans. And I love, I love, um, I like the class, but I love the point. The main point, it's kind of a twist end at the end of this section. We've already seen how Paul likes to throw out the twist endings. But I love the ending and it has the way that Paul takes all of these things that we're going to talk about tonight and then spins it at the end to make his point has major, major influenced how I do my teaching and preaching and my own personal Bible study. And I think that it will, I think it will you too. I, I hope that it will, um, even if it doesn't change you, it'll give you another reason to keep on the, the way that you are if you, if you do this already. So I'm excited to talk about some of that. But um, let's just do a, since tonight is the conclusion from 118 all the way down to chapter 3 and verse 8. Um, let's talk about like just a one sentence. What has Paul's main point been up to this point in the book? And because I think you have to know that coming into class tonight, you have to know what, what we've been talking about for one, two, three, I think three classes, maybe four, probably three. Um, if you can say it in one sentence, that's fine. But here are some other things I would like for you to think about. And I know you haven't had any heads up to do this, but can you think of any key verses like, what are the key verses that really draw out the point that Paul has made up to this point? What do you think about that? How would you summarize what we've done? Yeah, Ed? No partiality with God. Yeah, that's... Did you read the thing that I wrote about that? Um, don't call a sparrow a chicken. That's how some languages treat the... Um, God. It's the, no partiality with God is literally... Um, God doesn't look at the face. Um, and then some languages will treat that. Don't call a sparrow a chicken. Anyway, God is completely, 100%, entirely um, fair with no partiality, which doesn't really work out for any of us because fairness for me means condemnation for my sin. Yeah, Ryan? The verses that come out to me are uh, in chapter 2, 12 and 13. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Yeah, and then the implication. And you haven't done it. You're not right with God just because you have heard the law. Gentiles have heard the law. It's not just, that was one of my two, right? I have Romans 2, 13 up there. My first one, I think, is Romans 1, 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all. The emphasis there is all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. God, we've all earned ourselves a place in the realm of God's wrath because of our ungodliness and unrighteousness. And when the main point up to this stage in the book is all of us, even you, the chosen people of God, Jews, who he's targeting here. Anything by way of reminder or summary up to this point before we get rolling into class tonight? So then you get into, oh, I don't know. I said I was trying to figure this out. And I figured out how to mark chapter 3 and verses 1 through 8. Um, you can take it or leave it. Remember that Paul has been doing this for 20 years up to this point. He's been dealing with the exact same issue, Jews and Gentiles. He knows what they're going to say. He anticipates their objection. And, you know, it's kind of hard to do that in the text and to know when he's saying the words of the objector and when he's giving his answer. And so I just wrote, I just wrote in the margin over here in red, I wrote ob objection and in green, I wrote answer because red is bad and green is good. And so next to verse one, I put a red O objection. 
next to verse 2, I put a green A. So I'll remember, this is, these are the words of the objector, and then here's Paul's answer. Here's the words of the objector, and here's Paul's answer. Maybe that will help keep it straight if you're looking for a way to do that. And then we get to verse 9. This is going to be the conclusion of everything up to this point. What then? Are we Jews better off? And listen to the answer. No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. What verse are we at? So, that will save me from reading. <laughs> Are Jews better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, um, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. And so, what we're going to do now is we're going to move into six Old Testament quotes. This is just a string. This is the longest string like this in the New Testament. It's just a string of six Old Testament quotes, just one after the next, with no introduction or anything like that. And so if you don't have references in your Bible that tell you where the Old Testament quote is coming from, write those in there so you know that it's coming from somewhere. Um, verses 10 through 12. This is the first one. None is righteous, no not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Let's, let's actually go there. I think that I, I tried to pare down some of these texts so that we'll be able to read some of them. Make sure and stick your marker here in Romans and turn over to Psalm, uh, what is it, Psalm 14. Whenever we get to Psalm 14, can somebody just read verses 1 through 4? Also, oh, I didn't write that down up there. I'm sorry about that. Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 are almost identical. So if you're already in Psalm 14, just write Psalm 53 in the margin so you can remember they're almost the same. There's only one little sentence that's different between the two, but they're almost exactly the same thing. So your Bible might say, this is a quote that comes from Psalm 53. It's the exact same Psalm. So don't worry about that. Somebody, would you read Psalm 14, 1 through 4? The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They are abominable. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call upon the Lord? Okay. Who, who is being criticized in Psalm 14? Who is the psalmist talking about? Is that how, that's how he starts out, right? Um, in verse 2, the Lord looks down from heaven on the children of men. That's all of us. <laughs> well, not Jesus. Children of woman. Did you have one, Adam? Or Paul, was it you? I thought I saw a hand back here. What else do you see about these four verses? Like, what's the drum beat? I mean, if you, if you were inclined to do such a thing, you would, even if it's just a pencil, you know, mark the all, everyone, all the time, no one. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man. That's everyone. To see... If there are 
any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they've become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. They have no knowledge, all the evildoers. And so, yeah, you've got this every single person. And, and I don't think that we actually need to make this comment. But you see how that fits into the point that Paul's been making, right? You see why Paul would think to call on this quote to say to the Jewish people, hey, everyone is under the wrath of God because they're sin, even you. And so he calls on this quote that has this drumbeat of all, everyone, no one does right. There's no one who knows to do anything good. So... That's Psalm 14. Any comments about that one? Or thoughts about the psalm and the quote there? So what you would do um, next to Romans, just, you know, write in some way, if you don't have these notes already, verses 10 through 12 is a quote from Psalm 14. And also Psalm 53, if you care to do that thing. Okay. Then we have verse 13. Um, at least the first two lines of verse 13. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. Where does that quote come from? Psalm 5 and verse 9. Let's go back to that one. Um, would somebody read Psalm 5 and verses 4 through 10, please? For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. <coughs> but I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. All right. Who is the subject of the criticism in this psalm? Who is the psalmist talking against? What's that? Yeah. And what would you think about that? Like Paul, Paul quotes verse 9. In Romans, he, he quotes the second part of verse 9 where it says, Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. But in that section, he's, he's describing, look at verse 4. This is the person he's describing. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. And then he goes on to describe the wickedness and the evil. And Paul quotes a verse from this section describing the wickedness of the evil, he quotes it in Romans to refer to his Jewish audience. Do you, can you imagine how that would make somebody feel? <laughs> can you imagine what the listeners would have thought when they, when they heard this? Like if they know the psalm and they know who's being referred to and Paul says, that's you. That's kind of hostile, Luke. Kind of, when we were reading Psalm 14, 1 through 3, I looked down at verse 4, and it was talking about how there were workers of iniquity with no knowledge, um, and they would eat up my people as they eat bread. And it just kind of made me think about what Paul, I mean, if he was using that also, just like they were. Jews would come back, maybe they were like eating up the Gentile Christians like bread and wine. 
Yeah. And you know what your comment makes me think about is how he started off this letter in chapter 1 and verses 18 through 32. They do this, they do this, they do this, they do this. And then chapter 2, and you practice the very same thing. And were the Jews at this point listening to these quotes, knowing the context, saying to ourselves, whoa, that's me? And Paul's like, yeah. Other thoughts about that one? All right, then. Next in Romans chapter 3, and it's the very last, the third section of verse 13. The venom of asp is under their lips. Where does that quote come from? Psalm 140, is that what you said? Psalm 140, let's go there and let's read verses 1 through 5. Whenever you get there, would somebody do that? Psalm 140, um, verses 1 through 5. And notice the second part of verse 3 where it says, under their lips is the venom of asp. That's the quote in Romans. So read 1 through 5, please. Deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men who plan evil things in their heart and stir up wars continually. They make their tongue sharp as a serpent's under their lips is the venom of asps. Guard me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men who have planned to trip up my feet. The arrogant have hidden the trap for me, and with cords they have spread a net. Beside the way they have set snares for me. Who, who is he talking about here? How does he describe them? Just run through the list, and what are the names that he calls this category of person? Violent men. Evil, violent, arrogant, wicked. wicked, arrogant. <laughs> so you take this and, and don't lose sight of where we are back in, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 9. It's why I put this one up here. Paul says to the Jews, he says, are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all both Jews and Greeks are under sin as it is written. And then he quotes, the venom of asp is under their lips. You are the wicked, the arrogant, the evil, all of these different things. He quotes this passage and, and aims it at them, targets them with it. Um, let's see, verse 14. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Where does that quote come from? Okay, Psalm chapter 10 and verse 7. Let's go to that one and let's see. On this one, let's read verses 2 through 11. Caught in the schemes that they have devised. For the wicked boast of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, There is no God. His ways prosper at all times, for judgments are on high. Out of his sight, as for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved throughout all generations. I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages and hiding places. He murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws them into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Okay. So it was verse 7, right? Chapter 10 and verse 7, that's where the quote comes from. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. I think in this one, 
look at how this could maybe look at how this could maybe apply to this audience, this Jewish audience. In verse six, this evil person says, "I won't be moved throughout all generations. I shall not meet adversity. Nothing bad's going to happen to me." And then there's another one in verse eleven. He says in his heart, "God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it." God's not watching any of the bad stuff that I do. And Paul quotes this psalm and he says, this is you. The way that you think and the way that you act. Any comments on that one? I think verse 3 as well. For the wicked most in their heart's desire. We had that little conversation about the conscience. And so for a Jewish audience, it'd be like, well, I have the law. Um, so the conscience is the law of the Gentiles. But still, they needed a conscience to convict them that they were following their own heart's desire. Yeah, right. Good. Okay, Romans 3 and verses 15 through 17. This is one long quote. 16, 7, uh, 15, 16, 17. Describing this group of people, what the Jews are like. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. Where does that quote come from? Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59 and verses 7 and 8. You will probably recognize this one. If you go to Isaiah 59. Um, I, I like to come to Isaiah 59 a lot. Especially when... I'm studying, I'm studying the Bible with people who, it, it, this is one of the things that we talk about in the second lesson that I talk uh, about the problem and the problem of sin and what all of our problem is. In 59 and verse 1, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save or his ear dull that it cannot hear. It's not like God is in heaven saying, I want to reach out and save you, but I can't because my hand is too short and I can't reach you. Or it's not like you're crying out to God and he says, I want to hear you, but I can't. I can't hear what you're saying. He says, no, he doesn't have a short arm. He doesn't have a dull ear. In verse two, he says, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. And then he, we won't read the whole thing. But verse 3, listen to the context. Your hands are defiled with blood. Your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue mutters wickedness. All of these things. And, and then you get down to the end of verse 6. Deeds of violence are in their hands. Their feet run to evil. They're swift to shed innocent blood. Um, those are the quotes. And then we have one more. In verse 18, Romans 3.18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Where does that come from? Psalm 36 and verse 1, at least the second part of verse 1. Let's read verses 1 through 4 on that. Psalm 36, 1 through 4. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for he falters he flatters himself in his own eyes, that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. The words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. He has ceased to act wisely and do good. He plots trouble while on his bed. He sets himself in a way that, that is not good. He does not reject evil. Okay. I think especially verse two on this one. He flatters himself in his own eyes, that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. The Jewish listener is thinking, Paul is talking to a Jewish listener who thinks, I've got the law of God, I'm set, I'm good to go. And Paul's response to all of these people are, are Jews any better off than the Gentiles or any other sinner in the world? No, not at all, because all of us are under sin. And that's it. Do you have any comments about the quotes and how he uses those before we get into 
what I think is the twist. Yeah, Nick. Would a casual reader or listener of this text be able to identify all of these things that we're making up without referring to them? I think, obviously I, I can't know this, but I think that a Jewish listener absolutely would. Um, you know, we, we talk about knowing our Bible. I, I've told this story before, I think. One time I was in a world religions class, and uh, I went to a synagogue. There was a rabbi there. And he pulls out a scroll, and he opens up the scroll and lays it on the, on the table. And it's just Hebrew text with no gaps or lines or verses or anything like this. And he reads the text and he says, in your Bible, that's Second Chronicles 23 verse 14 or something like that. And so we got to talking about it and he's like, oh yeah, we all had to memorize the Bible. And it's just like, there's a level, <laughs> there's a level of knowing the Bible that I, I'm extremely, first thing I say is jealous of. And then I'm like, there's no reason to be jealous of it. I just haven't worked that hard. Um, yeah, I think that if you're a Jewish person who grows up in a home, you go to synagogue, your life revolves around being a Jew, you hear these words constantly. Yeah, I think that you're, you're aware of where these quotes are coming from and what the contexts are. I think so. Other comments? So what if you're not? I mean, surely not all of Paul's listeners were these terrible, wicked, evildoers who just think of how am I going to sin tomorrow when I'm laying my head on my pillow at night? That's what some of the Psalms said. They're not all these kind of people, but this is one of the things that has been just truly earth-shattering to me as I think about what Paul does next in chapter 3 and verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. You want to take a stab? What do you think, what do you think of when you hear that sentence, especially in this context? What do you think about what Paul means by that and what he's getting at by that? How about this? I'll, yeah, go ahead. Well, my interpretation would be it was never really about those people out there, even though that's what your initial reading might be. Who's the law written for? It's the Jews. And so these passages are immediately applicable to them. Yeah. So you're reading... You're reading all of these Psalms, Psalm 14, Psalm 5, Psalm 140, that's condemning all of these wicked people out there. They're not reading the Bible. But what Paul says is the Bible was written for you, and you are the one who has the Bible that's talking about this stuff. And so what would the point of that be? What? You're, it's for you. I mean, obviously it would be cool if that wicked guy out there wouldn't do that stuff. But I'm not talking to him. He doesn't care anything about God. I'm writing and talking to you. And here are the best ways I, I can think of to illustrate this point. Who is Jonah to? Dave can't answer. <laughs> well, maybe if nobody else answers. Jonah is to Nineveh, right? Because that's where Jonah went out and his message was 40 days and Nineveh is going to be destroyed, right? But who is Jonah to? Jonah and his... Okay. Where can you find the book of Jonah? In the Bible. And who is the Bible for? God's people who have the Bible. What, what is about the book of Nahum? Who is the book of Nahum for? It's also about Nineveh. But where can you find the book of Nahum? In the Jewish Bible for the Jewish people to read. And what God is saying here in verse 19. Now we know 
that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. And the, the great big point in all of this is, you Jewish people think that you are special and right before God simply because you have the law and you judge all the other sinners out there because they violate the law. But when in reality, this book that talks about the law, it's really for you and you violated it. I think about this one. I've got a little note here in my, in my margin of my Bible to think about this and I, I get, we, we won't, maybe we should turn over there and look at this one. Look at Luke chapter 13. This, I think, should change the way that we think about the Bible and the way that we think about ourselves and the way that we preach and teach. Luke chapter 13, and I'll start reading in verse 22. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? That's something that we all want to know, right? Who, who's going to be in and who's going to be out? Who's going to be lost and who's going to be saved? Are there just a bunch of lost people out there? And what was Jesus' answer? When I learned this in elementary school, we called it understood you. Because you put a you in the sentence... It's understood, even though it's not actually written in there. Jesus said in verse 24, You strive to enter through the narrow door. Hey, what about all those lost people? Are there a bunch of lost people out there? And Jesus says, You worry about yourself. That's the greatest parent statement of all time. And then, just keep on reading. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able... When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you. I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and we drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the peoples in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. What about all the lost people? Hey, you try not to be one of the cast out ones. How about that? How about that's what we think about 29. The people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some first will be last. And so I think, about, I think about that in this verse. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. In today's setting, what would be the application for that? Who, who is the one? I, I would think so. I would think, I mean, here I stand holding a Bible, reading from it right now learning about what God wants. Whatever the law says, it speaks. You're the one with the Bible. So that, I'm sorry, does anybody want to comment on that line of thinking? I don't know if you care about this. This was some of the stuff. I thank God I, you might disagree with some of this, but I have been, I think that God knew that I needed more than most people. So he gave me some really good teachers, in my opinion. And I've had some, I've had some guys that have really taught me bluntly and critiqued me when I made mistakes. And I've had two face into this verse and into the you worry about yourself this because it's really easy it's really easy to stand up here and to get amens and to get that was a great sermon 
super easy to do. All you got to talk, talk about is all those losers out there. Everybody wants to talk about that. Everybody wants to condemn everybody else. And I think what you take away from this is if this book is for anything, it's for me to learn from and to try and get my life right. And maybe I can share it with somebody else and on a small scale, try to help you too. So that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Um, that's Paul's way of saying to a group of people who thought that they were better than everybody else, it's time to shut your mouth because you're not. That every mouth may be stopped. Verse 20. This is the great conclusion. This is everything we've been doing since 2018. <laughs> By works of the law, no human being will be justified, made right in, the sight, in, in his sight, in God's sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. You and nobody else is right with God just because you have the law. That has never worked for anybody. Got anything you want to say about that? Yeah, Nick? Um, just in one sense, we talked about how Jonah was sent to Nineveh, but the book is really for the Jewish people. I feel like sometimes, I guess I should speak for myself, I read the Old Testament and say, oh, you know, God's talking to the Jews. Those Jews, how could they constantly turn away when they're in the desert? But at the same time, I'm the one holding the Bible, and it's also written to me as a Christian. I mean, I mean, Paul said those words. He said, it's not for them. It's not even about them. In 1 Corinthians 10, I do not want you to be unawares, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses. They all drank the same spiritual drink. Verse 5, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Verse 6, now these things took place as example for us that we might not desire evil as they do. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did and grumble as some of them did. Now these things happen. I'm sorry, I'm skipping big sections. Verse 11. Now these things happen to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. So yes, it's not about, it's not even about these Jews. It's about whoever is holding and reading the Bible at the time. That's the point. Which, in our context, that's us right now. Good point. Right on the money. Other thoughts about that? Dave? The thing about this context and how we're reading, I think, why is he saying all this at the get go? Why is he establishing this? And my answer to that kind of boils and funnels down to if somebody's going to make a change, they need to know where they are at. And sometimes, Knowing where they're at is a slap in the face of what they should have already realized and how you describe the teachers that you had. In other ways, you know, there's other approaches, obviously, uh, like soft approaches and gentle. Those don't work with me. That's it. That's what I sent Paul to in trying to win these people over so they can see where they're needing to start at in their hearts. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's the last thing that I have to talk about in this class. Is, and you ask the question, why is Paul saying these things? You've got the whole setting. We've talked about it several times now. The church starts out Jewish in nature. The Jews get kicked out of Rome for four or five years. It's 100% Gentile because Jews are not allowed to be in Rome. And then the Jews come back and they've been back on the scene and they walk into these churches and it's, all right, I'm back. And, and, and the, you can imagine what happens in the church at Rome because of this. And the way that Paul starts the book to address this problem is to say, you group of people need to calm way down and not think more highly of yourself than you ought. Because we are all sinners in the sight of God. Or how about this? Calm way down and not think more highly than you ought because none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. He's really lathering it up, which I think then would be the, if there is a practical to this, you know, what, how do we resolve conflict within a church? Sometimes, sometimes, like Romans, the solution may be that somebody needs to have a big helping of humble pie and remember that you're not as cool as you think you are. I'm not as cool as I think I am. I'm not as righteous and holy as I think I am. That's going to be step one for us getting along. Oh, yeah, he could have shut any of these people down. <laughs> you think you're cool? And he didn't because he realized. I mean, that's what, that's what the first step is always going to be in us functioning together as a, as a functional body of God's people is just a huge dose of humility to know that I'm not any better than you. You're not any better than me. We all stand as sinners before God. Now, now that we've come to that, maybe we can take a step forward. But we've got to establish that first. Any last comments before we're done for tonight? Um, this is what I need you to do. Verses 21 through 26. That's what we're going to do on Sunday morning. Read it and read it again and read it again and read it again and read it again. Romans 3, 21 to 26 may be the fullest description in the Bible of what Christianity is and how Christianity works. And we need to know it. So we're going to spend a whole class just on these, uh, what, five verses or so. And we're going to break it down and we're going to talk about the righteousness of God and grace and justification and propitiation. And we're going to talk about all that stuff. All right. Thanks for your comments tonight.